Welcome to the uh, HFL 270 Module 1. Um, this module, which is a roughly a five-week module, actually it's a, uh, a four-week module, has to do with investigating other roles that are associated with the facility manager in many facilities. If you're in a large facility, more than likely you'll have a singular role that has a fairly narrow scope, but has a very, uh, you know, lots of um, a detail. Um, in smaller facilities, your scope of your role often grows, and you can pretty much guarantee if you get down to the size of a critical access facility, um, you're probably wearing, you know, somewhere between six to eight hats. Uh, and it's, it could be, again, working in a small facility could be a great learning opportunity to get a very broad understanding of healthcare and all the different jobs and responsibilities on the environmental care side of things. Um, the downside is is that uh, it, it, it is really involved and you end up chasing and putting out um, so many fires just try to keep up that you learn um, in, in sort of a Swiss cheese kind of way. But it, it, but it's such a great tool. I had the luxury of being, I guess, at a medium-sized facility, if you will. It still had lots of responsibilities. Um, my bet, my hospital was a 250-bed hospital um, with large outpatient, and we were also affiliated with three or four other hospitals around us. Uh, I guess that would be considered kind of medium-sized facility. And uh, but still, I wore quite a few hats. Um, when I went to a smaller facility that was just over 100 beds, about 140 beds licensed, um, I added more hats, mainly because of the size of the facility, but also because of my continued experience and growth in my career. So what I want to do is, though, I want, in this module, we're going to go into more detail um, in this module. And we're going to, right now, on this particular lecture, I want to touch on a few of these, these, these jobs, but you're really going to investigate deeper just four of these. The ones that we're going to uh, touch on today um, with this lecture is safety officer, life safety officer, emergency management, security protection services, biomedical engineering, and environmental services. Um, I imagine I could have thrown in telecommunications, I could have thrown in dietary, I could have thrown in materials management, and I'm sure there have been even facility managers that have taken on additional responsibilities besides that. Obviously, you get the one project manager in there as well, but we spend a lot of time on project management in the core courses. So we're going to talk about each of these. Um, just want to share with you a little background on them um, and then give you just a little insight as to some of the uh, specific characteristics of these jobs. First one is safety officer. Now we have spent quite a bit of time on safety officer and, and the environment of care standards and we even had a section, I remember back a while in one of the classes where it says I am the safety officer. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. But I just want to make sure that you understand that this responsibility very frequently goes to the facility manager. And if they're not getting the responsibility of the safety officer, they're very frequently one of the core members on the safety committee. Um, because as you already know, in the environment of care, you know, five of the seven standards are very directly, very specifically uh, facilities or maintenance or engineering. So the safety officer is, is a key role. Uh, again, this is one of those roles where it does take a lot of leadership qualities, especially if you're the chair of the committee, and it does take a very good understanding of the standards and joint commission and collaboration and organization and meetings and minutes. And really, um, you know, it's one of those things where you have to be very, very patient as a safety officer because there are so many things that you can do, you have to prioritize and create risk assessments. And really, it's, it's a lot of organization for the, safe, for the safety officer. It really truly helps if you're in the size facility where you have a secretary or somebody who's very competent at taking minutes and helping organize information, particularly as it relates to environment rounds and things like that. But the safety officer is definitely one of the roles. And it is a role that is, um, you know, in some facilities, it's pretty highly regarded. In other facilities, it's perceived as just something that has to be done. And so I'm not going to say it's a thankless position, but uh, for the most part, it is a position that is not recognized as um, a high profile position, um, except when you're obviously needed uh, during survey and such. So when you get into this position from a leadership perspective, you know, it is my take that, you know, the safety team, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to build teamwork and collaboration within the um, 
your, your environment of care team. And, and that's really, really the way I always treated it. It's a real, it's a team effort and uh, it's a divide and conquer effort. Uh, one warning, and we've talked about this previously, is just work really, really hard at organizing your meetings with an agenda, uh, with a format of delivering a meeting, and keeping people, you know, basically in check and keeping things moving forward and try not to bite off too much. But it's a, it, it is a, a excellent position to learn an awful lot about um, the environment of care and to work with many other folks in the clinical and administrative environment. Life safety officer, now this is interesting. I, I know most of you probably may be thinking, you know, well, life safety officer, that sounds strange. Maybe maybe it's not very, it's not something that's in your vernacular. I put it here because when you look at the environment of care standards and you look at all the responsibilities of life safety in the life safety chapter and the joint commission standards, it is very comprehensive and there is a lot of detail. Um, the good news is the detail is very specific. And that's what a lot of folks like about it because it's very, very specific life safety, some of the things you have to do. For example, you know, whether it's fire extinguisher checks or whether it's the damper checks or, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, testing of the, of the fire system and stuff like that or the fire pump. It's so specific that it's a checklist with dates and it's very organized. I mean, somebody who likes to be very, very organized, someone who likes calendars and schedules and likes things to be very exacting. And there are a lot of people who are like that. They have that personality where they love that, staying right on top of something and checking it off. Whereas some people want to live a little more vicariously. But the life safety officer, I think is a role that needs to be specifically designated and created and assigned. And again, we touch on an awful lot. Most people assume it automatically drops to the facility manager. Um, I'm sort of split on that. I think that um, it could, it, in and of itself, it could go to security and protection, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, because they're there 24 by 7, and I think there's a lot of elements that they could pick up, and I think that uh, it does create more value to your security protection forces in healthcare. Um, one of the greatest challenges we, one has, though, with this is that there is a perception, particularly with larger facilities, that have protection services that, um, and again, this kind of comes from outside of healthcare, but firemen and police officers don't mix in, in, in certain ways. A police officer will, will very specifically tell you, I'm not a fireman. Of course, a fireman will say, I'm not a police officer. And what happens when you get into healthcare is the perception from security folks that come from outside of law enforcement is, is that you're asking them to be a fireman and it's just ingrained in them that they're not. Um, I think, again, that's a, a paradigm shift that, that they need to adapt to. Um, there are many, many good reasons why I believe that security protection services should be intimately involved with um, life safety. However, it often resides inside the uh, bracket of facilities management and, and maintenance and engineering. Um, I don't have a problem with that either, but in either case, it does need to be assigned. Um, if you have the luxury of having a large enough organization where you have somebody that specifically is a life safety officer, well, then it's very easy to create this job description and understand its roles and responsibilities. Emergency management. Now, this is one we are going to go into some detail. Even though we did touch on this fairly frequently um, in our studies in the past, I want us to formalize this process here by going into um, you know the exercise we're gonna, we're gonna you're gonna you're gonna partake in, um, and this is a good time to talk about that exercise. You know what we're gonna do here is you're going to write, if you will, a summary, a research summary using web information. Um, with one of the assignments, I'm asking you to do an interview of somebody for one of the four jobs that you're gonna do the papers for. Uh, but I want you to really get a nice couple of paragraph summary of what the job is about. This is sort of a paper about the job. Then what we're gonna do is you're gonna take the next step and you're gonna create a job description. And I'm gonna give you a template for a job description. And what I really want inside this job description are a lot of core duties and responsibilities. But I want these core duties and responsibilities written around your research, but also written around the standards. I want you to go back, examine the standards specifically for these roles and responsibilities and I want you to extract out of those, those very specific elements of performance or standards that apply to the job and need to be a core responsibility. I think that that should be the foundation of every job description in healthcare because the standards um, 
again, they are a core responsibility. And I think tying it to the standards is a good way for it to become clear as, you know, clear as can be as to what a position in a role is responsible for. And then, of course, uh, you know, the, the last thing you're going to do um, with the, with, with the, with the uh, assignment is you're going to do the job description, you're going to do the roles and summaries, and then you're going to take it one step oh, further. Sorry. You're going to go back and extract your biomedical engineering. Biomedical engineering now um, is one of those jobs where it can almost often even go almost unnoticed. It's, it's often contracted out. Uh, because they seem to be sometimes so separate from everybody else kind of doing their own job. And I've never truly understood that because maintenance and biomed have a lot of things in common. Uh, obviously, they're both taking care of equipment. They're both using computerized maintenance management systems. They're both doing very similar quality customer service reporting. Technically, they're a little different with the equipment that they use. Uh, in some cases, really, biomed is using the same equipment. It's just smaller or it's measuring more precise measurements. I will say that biomed is tends to be a little more precise than maintenance in facilities. However, I do think that this, that's changing. I think maintenance in facilities is learning that it has to be uh, precise as well, more and more and more in many areas. Um, so I think as time has gone on, they're, they're getting more and more in common than less in common. But biomedical engineering, they do have a very large responsibility in healthcare organizations. Uh, most of you probably know, and I've said it before, I came out of biomedical engineering, clinical engineering. Um, you know, I worked with, you know, laboratory and radiology and uh, a lot of surgical equipment and many, many other things inside um, healthcare. But um, it is one of those, those jobs and those responsibilities that it helps to understand the roles, the responsibilities, and again, and get a sense of what do they have to measure? What are they responsible for as it relates to the Joint Commission Standards? Um, again, you'd be surprised just how many different types of equipment. And there's also kind of a line between biomed and maintenance that has to be discussed. Uh, for example, the three items that I can tell you right off the top of my head that always came up as an issue, is it biomed or is it maintenance? Were the uh, OR tables, the OR lights, and uh, well, sterilization always was, a, was that issue too. And um, there was another that I was thinking of. Oh, and warmers, uh, blanket warmers. Those are the ones that seemed like nobody ever wanted to take responsibility for them. Who was responsible for what part? Uh, but there needs to be very clear lines delineated, and someone just has to take responsibilities for those things. So I think that there's definitely some lines between biomed and engineering. And in some cases, I've seen where they're very intimately involved with each other and, and often even inside the same department. Environmental services, again, this is another one that um, there should be a very uh, symbiotic relationship in between environmental services and maintenance. Um, one of our students that I, um, had talked about how when they eat, when every time they work in a room, a patient room, they coordinate with environmental services. And after they work in the room, environmental services comes in and does a, I think they even said terminal clean, but a clean of the room. Uh, no doubt that when you do a, um, um, uh, mate our projects there has to be tight coordination between environmental services and maintenance or if you're doing room PMs um, that was always a great team effort that, that I was involved with when it came to room PMs because it was such a perfect opportunity to strip and wax floors and you know and work with environmental services to make that room you know just as good as it could possibly be for the patient um, also environmental services they're in the room every day with the patient so they see things going on with the room and they can certainly be of a help to facilities when it comes to working with environmental services. So um, it, it's one of those folks that we if we got to work close to these folks. I mean, I think you're gonna hear that over and over again. If you're not directly responsible for it, there has to be a really strong working relationship with them. And so many times, you know, working together, you can get so much more done and you can put together just a really great perception with the customer, which feeds into our age caps and customer service scores and everything else in the organization. So environmental services is one of those departments that it truly does help to have that nice tight relationship. Um, you know, I, I kind of forgot to mention one of the service. Sometimes it relates to environmental, sometimes it's not and it's laundry. Uh, there's kind of a blurry line sometimes between environmental and laundry. Uh, often it's a separate total department that's contracted out or it could be another department inside the organization so but environmental services like I said you know these folks are not just housekeeping I think that was another shift that occurred uh, some years ago 
where we quit calling them housekeepers and housekeeping and start calling them environmental because they are much bigger than just housekeeping and housekeepers. So when you study the manager and, and the responsibilities of the manager and the requirements of this role, it might not seem so large, but I think if you dig deep, you'll find they have one of the, a super, a very large job when it comes to the healthcare environment. 